So welcome to 22nd Century Management with Ken. If you're watching on YouTube and you haven't already done so, do me a favor, go ahead and hit the subscribe and the notify button. That way you'll get notified when I release my next video. And there's a new video every week. If you're listening on a podcast, obviously subscribe on your favorite podcast player. Today I have with me Art Johnson. He is the CEO of Infinity Systems a management consulting firm where he helps leaders identify and rectify organizational misalignment. Previously, he implemented a strategic plan to improve alignment at Medtronic, the world's largest medical technology company, enabling it to grow top line 15% year over year in a flat market. His new book is The Art of Alignment, a data-driven approach to lead aligned organizations. So Art, welcome to the show. You want to Give us a little more of your background. Ken, thanks for having me. I I come from a background, mostly technology. I started at IBM, moved up the ranks pretty quickly, then moved into telecommunications at US West, served as an officer there, ran an organization of a couple billion dollars and maybe a couple thousand employees and quickly learned that it was super important to have organizational alignment to achieve top performance. Okay, so you talk about alignment in the book. You talk about how alignment results in measurable KPI changes. That one of the most striking stories is your work with Medtronic and how you achieved a double-digit growth in a flat sales environment. Can you tell us a little more about that? So the overall market was flat, and in order to grow, that means you got to go take market share. And that's a difficult thing to do when you already have 55% of the market share. So we had to really get busy, get creative and figure out specifically what we needed to do to perform at a higher level. So earlier on in my tenure at Medtronic, I was given some tools by human resources to just kind of measure where the employee base was, like employee satisfaction surveys, also employee engagement surveys. But Ken, I quickly realized that engagement is just one aspect of it, because at the end of the day, we have to be engaged in the right things. So that's where this idea of adding purpose to engagement to create this entity or this measurement called alignment. And the entity in which we use to measure that is called orgometrics. So we began the process of measuring how aligned my organization was since I had responsibility for sales and I had some ancillary support around it. We had to figure out where we were and what we found was something startling. The further we got away from headquarters, the more disconnected or more misaligned we were and it became pivotal to get greater levels of alignment throughout the organization. So we measured it, brought my leadership team in, identified the areas of misalignment, and went to work on those things, and in about eight months measured again and found that we had made significant progress, and the outcome of that is what you described, 13% year-over-year growth in a flat market. And that's absolutely amazing because if the market's not growing, as you mentioned, uh, you've got to take it away from somebody else, and that's uh, hard to do. And so how can an organization judge if they are in alignment or not? Well, that's what you've got to go measure it. It's like, as Deming said, you can't manage it if you can't measure it. So part of the exercise is, is to measure that. And in the book, The Art of Alignment, we specifically talk about the nine pillars of measurement, which is to take the time to find out specifically where the areas of occlusion are, where the opportunities lie, where misalignment may be prevalent, but also where alignment exists so that we can continue to you know, bolster that, that piece of work that's going on, share it more liberally throughout the organization so that we can all learn from those best practices, which by the way, is one of those pillars of organizational alignment. Okay. So you worked for many years with many different kinds of organizations. What is one thing that unaligned organizations have in common? Well, you'll see turnover, voluntary turnover tends to run a little higher than it normally would in that industry. Um, You'll see people that uh, are not necessarily performing at their best, and it's it's referenced in performance evaluations. It's seen in participation in meetings. It's water cooler discussions that tend to drag the organization down, kill morale amongst employees. And so there are a number of ways to kind of see it. But one of the other things that we tend to look at is just the overall performance. How does the organization fare and perform versus its peer group? Okay. And so diversity, equity, and inclusion are all hot buzzwords right now. You believe that increasing organizational focus in these areas can yield big results in innovation and effectiveness? 
Absolutely. Can you tell me more about that? Absolutely. So, Ken, you know, if you identify misalignment within an organization, many times what you'll find is that the people within that group of misaligned folks are your disenfranchised people. Oftentimes, these look like people like me, people of color, uh, women. And so the degree to which we can get everybody coming together, bringing their best ideas, leaning in, doing all the things necessary to espouse the mission and vision of the organization, that's where we get our top performance. Because the old adage, uh, an army moves as fast as its slowest soldier, we got to get everybody going. And so, yeah, you want to feel included. You want your voice to be heard. You want to know that the organization cares about your thoughts and opinions. So that's part of inclusion. And it's interesting because I've had a couple of stints in major corporations and I have seen a lot of challenges in those areas because they want you to be there and show up and do what they want you to do. But when you see a better way or an opportunity to improve something, a lot of times they just snuff out any, any sign of initiative in you. And, and I'm like, stop, you know, I'm out here every day trying to make things better and you're killing my initiative. You're killing everything that, that makes me go. Yeah. Well, you, you know, you're, you're touching on something. Obviously one of the other pillars that we, we measure is this concept of empowerment and the degree to which people feel empowered to, to make their own decisions, to try something different, do a little risk taking. And that's a function of the type of culture that the leadership puts in play. And so, you know, again, these are all tenets of measurement around alignment, but yeah, empowerment is the one you just touched on. Okay. So you mentioned there's nine pillars and right. we talked a, a little bit on a couple of them. So you want to tell me about the rest of them? Right. So, you know, we talked just a second about leadership and, and what we're really trying to find there, Ken, is are the leaders within the organization authentic? Do they ask more questions than they answer? If they find themselves answering more questions, then they are the oracle of information and no decisions get made without their, them, their eyes seeing it or their ears hearing it. And so unfortunately, what that does is it stifles decision-making, it stifles innovation, it stifles creativity. And so all these things become drags on the organization. You don't get that real zip and energy. We don't make decisions as quickly. So we'd ask leaders to ask more questions, which is somebody comes in and says, hey, Ken, what do you think about this? And you stop, because even though you know the answer, you have to give yourself permission to not answer that question so that you can foster critical thinking and turn to that employee and say, you know, I don't know, Art, what do you think? And then that gives me a chance to share some of my thoughts and ideas that would have never seen the light of day if you hadn't turned it around. So this is one of the ways that leaders can start to drive critical thinking in the organization, more risk-taking, push decision-making down, which is the second pillar that I want to talk about, empowerment. How do we make decisions faster? Sometimes we even make better decisions, oftentimes we do, by pushing decision-making down. And out of that, we create a sense of accountability, which is that third pillar. And when we talk about accountability, we're talking about 360-degree accountability, not just I'm accountable to my boss, I'm accountable to my employee base. I'm accountable to the, those that are in the community. I'm also accountable to shareholders. Everyone that is a stakeholder in what it is we do, I have to show some sign of accountability. Teamwork's another thing that we measure. We look at this concept of how well do we operate as a team, not just within our own department, but how well does our department interact with others? And communication is critical. So we talk about communication being bi-directional but we also wanna make sure that we have lateral communication, which is we communicate between departments and divisions and so forth. So it, c communication is pivotal and it has a direct impact on creativity. We measure that independently as well. What we wanna know is we have a, a way by which we can capture good ideas and we have a way that we can also imbue those ideas in the organization and that requires some intentionality. And then uh, last couple here, I guess best practices we talked a little bit about, but this concept of development is pivotal because if you think you want me to give you my best work, but you got to give me the tools necessary to do it. Also, I'd be nice to know that you kind of have my back as well, which means you're going to help me round my resume in a way that if you fire me, I can still land on my feet. Let's face it. Your introverts have a tough time having those conversations. And if a third of the organization is made up of people that are you know, introverted, then many times they just vote with their feet. And we see millennials do this all the time. They just take off. You know, you call them up and you find out that they've got another job. So part of this is, is, hey, am I getting a chance to round my resume? 
in a manner that makes it such that I can get another gig. And then last but not least, this idea of measuring mission and vision. You know, it's so funny, Ken, I spoke at Villanova several years ago to a graduate school class of 44 students in the class. And I just asked them, I said, I'll give anybody in this room this $100 bill if anyone can recite their mission statement. No mistakes though. And I can't look it up. So only two tried, one got close, but no one could do it. So many times we don't even know what our mission is. And these are people in leadership roles. So it's important that we have a sense of that mission and vision so that we can know day to day what it is we're expected to do and how that contributes. Oh, you mean those mission statements aren't covering holes in the wall? <laughs> they may be covering holes in the wall. <laughs> you know, it, it seems like in a lot of companies, that's what they're for is to cover up a place you don't want to paint or something. And it's so interesting because so many of the things that you talked about resonate with me. And a good example of that is I teach service management. And before we set this up, we talked about that a little bit. And one of the things that, that I... I beat on my service managers that are in the class about is teaching their technicians to operate their territory like it's their business. Give them the responsibility, give them the authority, understand they're going to make mistakes, but mistakes are how we learn. <laughs> and it's amazing how, how big a struggle that is. You know, you're spot on. We as leaders many times put so many roadblocks in front of our employee base and we have no idea that we're doing it. And so oftentimes when we go through this exercise and, and we talk a little bit about it in the art of alignment, you know, this idea of creating an ecosystem of leaders. So leaders can kind of come together, coalesce around, all right, how do we drive real alignment in an organization? And some of the lowest hanging fruit out there is just to ask the, your direct reports, what specifically are the things that stand in the way of progress for you? Could you list those out? And when they list 10 of them, Ken, I bet you more than half of them are things you could draw a line through immediately. So part of the exercise is having the dialogue, getting the rocks out of the road and getting the hell out of the way. And, and that's funny too, because I wrote a blog post and I made the point about aligning compensation with results. And I'll just tell a quick story. I tell this in class all the time, but this is so common in, in businesses. I see it in the copier industry, but I saw it working for the manufacturer. When I went in, my first day with my new boss, he said, Ken, when you go out and visit dealers, I want you to spend two days with each dealer. And then a little bit later, and I says, I'm, I'm fine with that, John. It sounds good. No reason not to. A little bit later, he said, and your bonus structure is based on the number of dealer visits you do and the cost per dealer visit. And I said, John, you're paying me to do one day visits. He's like, no, I want you to do two days. I said, we got to change the bonus. Or are you getting one day visits? Because I, I come to work to feed my family. I'm going to do what does the best job of that. And, and I see it over and over again in organizations. They put the carrot way over here, where they, not where they want them to go, but it's just way over here in left field. And, and then they wonder why the team winds up in left field. Ken, you are so spot on. What you identified as massive misalignment. And part of the exercise in, in, in writing this book was to say, Okay, if we created this mission and vision of the organization, this is who we espouse to be. The question that we want to know is, to what degree is that true? So now we take the next step. We've got our mission, our vision. Out of that comes our strategic plan. Is that consistent with the mission and vision? Do we take the next step down? What are our key objectives? Are the key objectives consistent? Is the way that we measure performance consistent with that? I mean, all these things have to line up in a way that makes sense. And we have to compensate consistently with that. We have to evaluate performance consistent with that. And then we have to write adjust as we go along. And so part of this exercise is, is trying to figure out where that area misalignment is and roll up our sleeves and get to work. Yeah. Hey, one thing, just along those same lines, another thing that, that I heard a manager say one day, and it just floored me because I was talking about putting some incentive in place to get technicians to, to go where you want them to go. And I, in fact, I have a whole webinar that's entitled, put the carrot where you want the horse to go. And in that webinar, I use the analogy. Sometimes, you know, we don't have a carrot at all. And this is where this owner was. He says, I pay him $8 an hour. You know, that's, I expect him to work for me. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, you pay him for $8 an hour. Okay. You're going to get eight hours. You know, but you're not, may not get zero productivity in that eight hours, but you're going to get what you paid for. They'll show up and come to work every day. 
<laughs> but that's not what you want. You're spot on. It's so funny to hear you say that because I tell you, we, we hear all the time, we, we can lead a horse to water, but we can't make him drink. You know what we say to that? Sounds like you need a salt lick. <laughs> yeah. That's there you go. Me. I mean, there are no excuses. I agree 100% with that. I guess maybe it's an old school mentality where people don't understand and don't think about, okay, how do I get the maximum performance? In, in my illustration, I said, you don't get a long stick with a little tiny carrot out there. You put a big carrot almost touching the horse's nose. And, and then you just get the obstacles out of his way and we'll see what can happen. Right. You know, and uh, anyway, you, you and I are very much on the same page about a lot of those kinds of things. And I don't know why it's so hard for organizations to change. And so let me get your insight on this. Do you think it's harder for the entrepreneur that started a business to get these things aligned? Or do you think it's harder for corporations? I, I think it just depends on, again, leadership. You know, if, if you have a, a huge ego and you constantly need it fed, whether you are in a corporation or a small business that you've started, it's always going to be a problem because everything's really about you. And this is why you see leaders feel compelled to answer questions versus asking them. You know, Ken, I think we've talked about this before, but you know, my old man was the master of this. I go out, cut the grass as a youngster and come back in and say, Hey dad, how'd I do looking for, you know, to be paid, uh, which was not going to happen, but at least ask. And he'd come out, take a look. And then he'd just look at me and say, Art, is this your best work? One simple question. Is this your best work? And I'd look and see a spot that I missed and quickly say, uh, no, it's not my best work. And then he'd ask one more question. When do you think we'll see your best work? Well, guess what happened then? Um, you know, crank that lawnmower back up and get back out there and get the job done. But by asking effective questions, we got to the conclusion and let's not make it about me. Let's not, I'm not going to chastise this person. I'm not going to, you know, berate them on what they didn't do. I'm just going to ask them, is this the best you can do? And so part of this, what it does is it brings out purpose in our work. Why are we here? What is it that we've set out to do? Yes, I am engaged. I was fully engaged when I went out there to cut the grass. I mean, it's a ton of mosquitoes. It was hotter than hell, you know, but I'm out there cutting the grass regardless. I'm engaged, but I didn't have purpose for my work. The quality that was expected was not imbued in me. And by effective question asking, we got there. And I just think leaders have to be more about the intentionality of messaging to the organization and less about feathering their own ego. I would agree so much with that. And I love what you say about questions. And again, that's one of the things that I try to teach in the service management class is to get them as managers to think about using questions. Too often it's easy to give somebody an answer, but when you do that, you make them dependent. When you use questions, I use the analogy, teach them to fish. So use questions, teach them to fish through whatever it is they're working on, help them learn to think about the process and how to get from where they are to where they need to be. And then they start to become independent. And again, they start to become much more effective. Ken, you're right on. You foster critical thinking just by doing that. You get better ideas, you get better solutions, you get faster implementation, you get better buy-in, you get an energy and excitement about the work. You know, in chapter nine of The Art of Alignment, we talk about empowerment. And this is where you zap the energy into the organization versus sapping it of its energy. Yeah, I would agree so much with that. And I think you can transform an organization way beyond what it thinks its capabilities is by just uh, implementing some of these processes and procedures and, and changing mindset. In other words, just because you've always done something the same way, that's not necessarily the best way. You want to constantly look for improvement. It's just a constant cycle. Okay. Well, Art, I really appreciate you being with me today. I have enjoyed our conversation. You know, in our pre-conversation, we had a good conversation. I've enjoyed this one. But one of these days we'll have you back on, if nothing else, after your next book. Um, <laughs> I will put a link in, if you're watching on YouTube, it'll be in the description. If you're listening on a podcast, it'll be in the show notes. I'll put a link to Art's uh, website and to his book there. Like I said, I appreciate you as the audience being here. And again, if you haven't subscribed, please do so. And, and we'll see you next week. Thanks, Ken. Thank you very much.